on this episode of Death Row Stories. What's going on, man? A mother's throat is slashed and her two young sons are murdered. It was a bloodbath, and when a crime like that happens, there's someone in the house that did this. You were involved in the murder. Oh, yeah, you were. No motive, no explanation. By God, somebody is going to pay for these two boys being murdered. A buxom blonde, materialistic, a temptress. The state will be seeking the death penalty in this case. It just didn't seem real. I know that I'm innocent. There's a body on the water. He was butchered and murdered. Many people proclaim their innocence. In this case, there are a number of things that stink. This man is remorseless. He needs to pay for it with his life. The electric chair flashed in front of my eyes. Get a conviction at all costs. Let the truth fall where it may. Going to Florida in two days. I can't wait. You take the camera with you? Darlie Lynn and Darren Routier were high school sweethearts from Lubbock, Texas. They married when he was 20 and she was 18. They were the proud parents of three boys. What's your name? Devin. Do something special. Do a cartwheel. Wow, where'd you go, Devin? Oh, Ben. Hey. You okay? Yeah. Say hi, Diamond. Hi. Diamond, can you do a flip? No. The family moved to an upscale neighborhood in Dallas after Darren Routier's computer business took off. Oh no, Damon's driving. By all accounts, the Routiers were living a charmed life. But that would all change on June 6, 1996. It was an average day. It was an ordinary day. You know, I remember going to sleep. That night, Darlie fell asleep in front of the TV with her two older sons, Devin and Damon. Darren Routier was upstairs, asleep with their infant, and he said he heard Darlie yell for him, he heard a glass break, and that's when he came downstairs to find a bloodbath. I'm coming downstairs, running straight over to Devin, and there's blood all over. Six-year-old Devin Routier had two devastating wounds to his chest. They went completely through his body. He was impaled by a large knife. Darren tried to perform CPR. When I blew it into his mouth, the first thing that happened was air came out of his chest and blood just sprayed all over me. Oh, my God! Hold on, honey! Hold on! Damn! 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 Damn
she woke up and a man was over her and she started fighting with him. And she really wouldn't give any type of description because she said she couldn't remember and couldn't remember his face and couldn't remember anything about him. At the crime scene, detectives tried to gather pieces to a murky puzzle. I think the Rowlett Police Department was entirely overwhelmed, and they didn't know what to do. The way they were handling evidence, the way they were trying to take pictures, they have a camera guy going through there while others were picking up evidence, and it was just absolute chaos. The Rowlett Police Department had only handled one other multiple homicide in its history. So they called for help from retired Dallas County Lieutenant James Cron. Within minutes of his arrival, Cron developed a theory that ruled out an intruder. There was numerous items, watches and rings, all laid out on the island in the kitchen, and nothing was taken. Darley Wittier said that the assailant dropped the knife and she picked it up in the utility room, which led to the garage. The knife was covered with blood, they found evidence where it was laid on the carpet. They found where it was laid on the counter in the kitchen. But they didn't find any evidence of the knife being dropped in the utility room. But that's where she said she picked it up, which didn't correlate with the evidence. Darren hears glass break. And the troubling thing about that was there was broken wine glass there, and it was on top of her bloody footprints, which proves beyond any doubt that it was placed there after she'd been walking around down there. The red flags were so startling. He's like, this ain't making sense. And, and when a crime like that happens in the home, uh, an experienced detective goes, there's someone in the house that did this. As word of the murder spread, news crews descended on the Routier home. She was bleeding all over her neck, and she said, take care of my baby, take care of my baby. One neighbor says her son, Michael, had just spent the night Tuesday. I'm just so glad that he wasn't there last night. After Darley was released from the hospital, she and Darren were driven directly to the Rowlett Police Department, where they were questioned separately. According to police, in this critical moment, Darley's story shifted. Instead of waking to face an intruder, Darley now claimed her son Damon had woken her, calling Mommy, Mommy. She then saw a man with a knife and followed him into the utility room. I do not think that those two stories are mutually exclusive. Darley could have been awoken by a burglar and momentarily have a memory lapse or a blackout or whatever, and then also have some perception that she was woken by the baby. All I was thinking about was trying to save the babies. I mean, Darren and I tried to save the babies, but it was too late and the babies were gone. But we tried, we tried, and we have to live with that forever. Twelve days after the murders, Darren and Darley returned to the Rowlett Police Department for more questioning. They walked in voluntarily, but only one of them would walk out. At approximately 10.20 p.m. this evening, investigators from the Rowlett Police Department arrested Darley Routier. As for the father, Darren Routier, at this point we do not believe that he was involved in the murders. We believe that the white male suspect described by Darley Routier as the man that attacked her and murdered her children never existed. I watched it on the 10 o'clock news, my daughter being arrested. Had no clue. Had no idea. I looked up and there's Darley in handcuffs, crying. Darley was charged with capital murder and taken to the Dallas County Jail. It just didn't seem real, like it just couldn't be happening. I was just in a place of deep hurt, um, trying to survive, still in the shock that my babies were gone. Before being arrested for the murder of two of her sons, Darley Routier was a 26-year-old mother to three boys. Darley was known as a doting mother who baked cookies for her boys and their neighborhood friends. It's terrible to think a mother would do something like that, but uh, it's good to know that they caught the murderer. Darley's arrest came less than two years after Susan Smith claimed an assailant had taken her two boys before Smith herself confessed to driving them into a lake in South Carolina. As with Susan Smith, there were two young boys involved. Pretty quickly, Darley was called Dallas's Susan Smith. 
She is not a Susan Smith, and we're going to prove this. Concerned that Darley might be released on bail, Child Protective Services came to take her son, Drake, away from Darley's mother. I said, you're not taking Drake. We haven't done anything wrong. And she said, well, you think Darley's innocent, so we can't be assured that you'll protect him. And I said, my daughter is innocent until proven guilty, or is it changed now? Drake was temporarily placed in a foster home. And with Darley's trial approaching, the media spotlight only intensified. Sources say the Routiers may have been in financial trouble and had recently taken out large insurance policies on the two boys. The Routiers tried to fight back. There were two $5,000 life insurance policies that was not enough to even bury the boys. I'll stand behind Darley 150%. I know she didn't do it. I know all the millions of little pieces of this puzzle that will come out in the trial. After their radio interview, Darley's mother and Darren were handed subpoenas for violating a gag order against talking about the case. To represent them, they hired legendary Dallas attorney Douglas Mulder, who also agreed to take on Darley's case. It is an interesting case, and, and uh, I'm going to look forward to trying it. I'm very happy. For what reason? He's the best. Mulder's fee was $250,000, and the routiers scrambled to raise all the money they could. We started selling everything in the house. All our family members started taking their children's college funds. We sold everything. Greg Davis was the lead prosecutor assigned to the case. The only real announcement that we made today was that the state will be seeking the death penalty in this case. Davis would only try Darley for Damon's death, since victims under age six qualify for the death penalty. The reason the state tries for only one murder is that if she's found innocent, they can try her for the second one. And, and that's a way for the state to, to, to load up a double-barreled shotgun. Given the media circus in Dallas, the trial was moved to the small, conservative town of Kerrville, Texas. Why that was agreed to is really unfathomable to me. Richard Mosty, second chair on Darley's defense, was raised in Kerrville. Doug Mulder always says to me, he says, uh, Mosty, if I ever get murdered, I want you to promise that my murder will get tried in Kirk County. On January 6th, 1997, Darley's trial began. Her family, who had all been called as witnesses, were banned from the court. But Darren's Aunt Sandy slipped under the radar. Darla Lynn had asked me, please, would you come to the trial? I, I have to tell you, I'd never been to trial in my entire life. All I'd ever seen was Perry Mason. <laughs> so I didn't, I really did not know what to expect. So everyone's behind Darla 100%. She had no one in that courtroom other than me that she could turn and look to. True crime novelist Barbara Davis, who would later publish a book about the case, was also in the courtroom. Greg Davis is an extremely dynamic prosecutor. He had a way of making you believe what he said was the God's truth. He began painting Darley as materialistic, a buxom blonde, all worried about her own self and how she looked, and a temptress, so to speak. Greg Davis constantly portrayed her as a psychopath. On the stand, retired Lieutenant James Cron laid out his case for a staged crime scene. Jewelry left on the kitchen counter, the murder weapon suspiciously moved, and a slashed window screen in the garage. Burglars, intruders don't usually cut a screen because they know you just can pry a screen off very easily. I think it, it's just a part of staging. Next, the Dallas County Medical Examiner described Darley's wounds as superficial and potentially self-inflicted. They didn't go deep, and it was just a straight slice across this way, and that's why we call them superficial wounds. But if there really was a killer in there doing those things to those boys, he would have stabbed Darley Routier multiple times right through the chest, just like he did those boys, and she'd be dead. The state also focused on blood spatter from the two boys, found on the back of Darley's nightshirt. Our blood expert was able to demonstrate how that happens if you're kneeling over someone and stabbing them. He just showed you come up, and when it comes up is when the cast off happens. But obviously, that's the manner that had to be stabbed. And stabbed and stabbed and stabbed and stabbed. And that remained in that jury's mind. For Darley's defense, Doug Mulder called two doctors, one who said Darley was suffering from traumatic amnesia, and another who felt Darley's wounds had not been self-inflicted. 
Mulder also focused on the 911 call from the night of the murders. The 911 tape, when I heard it, I was very convinced that she was an hysterical mother. But all of a sudden, Darley was worried about touching a knife. What grieving mother would even think of that? She went from being a victim in their eyes to a murderer of two little children. Finally, prosecutors showed the jury a news report shot eight days after the slayings. Happy birthday to you. Happy For some, this may seem a strange thing to do in an odd place and time. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Singing happy birthday in a cemetery to a son who was brutally stabbed to death just over a week ago. Love you, Devin and Damon. It was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen. Uh, not how you'd expect a mother whose boys had been brutally murdered to act, to grin, to smack gum, and to shoot silly string. My gut reaction was what I think the majority of the public was. How could a mother who just lost her two sons do something like that? And the cameras were there to capture it, and I think that sealed her doom. During deliberations, the jury asked to see the silly string videotape nine times. And after only eight hours, they returned with their unanimous verdict, guilty. Night had fallen when Darley arrived at the Texas Department of Corrections. Considered a suicide risk, Darley was dressed in a white paper gown for her walk to death row. It just didn't seem real, like it just couldn't be happening. It seemed like a nightmare. Do you have anything to say? Do you have any comments? Is there anything you would like to say? After Darley Routier was sent to death row, her family quickly ran out of money to pay her attorney, Douglas Mulder. We had to sign a paper even after she was convicted that for two years, if we did any uh, movies or books or whatever, we owed him the balance. The courts appointed J. Stephen Cooper to lead Darley's appeals. As an appellate lawyer, you get the transcript of the trial and work from the transcript. It's strictly from what's on the page. In this case, what was on the page was erroneous in large parts, and we had a lot of issues on reconstructing the trial transcript. Darley's trial transcript had over 30,000 mistakes. It was very serious, the difference between yes and no, the difference between, you know, up and down. And I'd never seen that before in 25 years of practicing law. When Sandra Halsey, the court reporter for Darley's trial, was questioned, she pled the Fifth Amendment. Cooper felt confident the flawed transcript could earn a new trial for Darley, preferably in a courtroom away from Kerrville. This drew concern from prosecutors. When all of this came to light, the state offered her a life sentence, and all she would have to do is basically admit that she had killed her children. And what did she say? No. And what does that tell you about Darley? Uh, she's strong, she's brave, and she's innocent. But just hours before the scheduled hearing, the judge denied Darley's motion. These demonstrators protested a state district judge's decision to cancel a hearing in Routier's case, originally set for today. We're the voice for Darley Lynn Routier. The issue with the court reporter literally changed the court reporting industry. And there are many people to this day who are astounded that that trial record did not result in a new trial for Darley Routier. Darley's defense now faced the uphill battle of appeals. But as Cooper dug through evidence, he came across a second videotape, never shown to the jury, which cast the Silly String incident in a very different light. The Silly String was a major factor in her conviction from the jurors' own mouths. But what was not shown the jury was this two-hour memorial video that took place uh, before the Silly String incident. 
This second video was secretly filmed by police, attempting to capture any guilty comments made at the boys' memorial. The preacher was there, the family was there, prayers, crying, the emotion you would expect, all appropriate behavior. I got you some silly string. Her sister brought the silly string. It wasn't Darley's idea. This was my son's birthday, Devin's birthday. And my sister and her boyfriend went and got silly string. He loves silly string. We did for them what Devin didn't get to have and what we knew that he would want and enjoy. They took that and they twisted it and they turned something that was supposed to be beautiful and tried to make it into something very ugly. When Doug Mulder brought up the tape during the trial, the detectives who were asked about it pled the fifth. We have a lady on death row in Texas who in the course of the litigation, the only three people who took the Fifth Amendment were the two lead detectives and the court reporter. The question for Cooper was, why hadn't Mulder shown this second videotape to the jury? I don't know why they didn't show the tape. Greg Davis said, you put it in if you want, uh, but they never did put that portion of the tape in. I think it was a huge mistake not to show the jury this memorial service. I think it would have effectively nullified any impact the uh, Silly String video had. As he continued to build Darley's appeal, Cooper was confronted with another question. Why had Mulder never raised Darley's husband, Darren, as a possible suspect? Let's be practical about this. There are two adults in this house, and there's two dead children. And Darley is sliced and cut and beat severely. Well, the most logical culprit of that, if it's not an intruder, would be the husband or Darren. In addition to defending Darley, Doug Mulder had represented Darren in his gag order case. Well, we've alleged in several appellate pleadings that Mr. Mulder was suffering from a conflict of interest. At the time that Doug Mulder represented Darley, he had a continuing duty to protect Darren. I was in the room when Mulder and Darren had that conversation. Darren had said, you know, well, I don't want them going after me because I didn't do anything. And Mulder said, well, uh, you didn't do anything. I don't see any reason to go after you. And that was that. It would be very difficult to point a finger at Darren when the person on trial says, my husband's not involved. At that time, that was just absurd to me. It was, I didn't even want to hear anything like that. What you didn't really hear about at the time was the life insurance on Darley, of which Darren was the beneficiary. It was 250000 This insurance policy raised questions, even with one of Darren's own family members. This is my nephew, and I love him. I don't know if Darren was involved. I know that that is a big question. Everybody has their answer to that. In my heart, I say no. In my head, I have a few questions. To answer those questions, Sandy contacted multimillionaire Brian Pardo. Something of an armchair detective, Pardo supports the death penalty, but funds investigations for inmates he thinks are innocent. I felt that it was extremely important to exclude Darren, and the only way that he was going to be eliminated as a suspect was to pass a polygraph, because that's what the police like to do. Can you name the person that stabbed your son? No. The results of Pardo's investigation were about to uncover dark secrets that Darren had kept hidden for years. Darley Routier had been on death row for 15 months when Brian Pardo began raising questions about her husband, Darren. Darren adamantly denied any involvement in the murders of his sons, and to prove it, he submitted to a polygraph test. Did you yourself stab Darley on June 6, 1996? No. The polygraph examiner was with the police department. He came around the other side of the table and he sat down, and he said, Darren, you have utterly failed this examination. It looks to me like you perpetrated this crime. Because you were involved in the murder. Right. Oh, yeah, you were. And right. in what way? In what way? Yeah. You, you helped plan it. You were there when it happened. And you helped carry it out. 
Hey, you stand your No, I do not. Oh, yeah, you do. No, I do not. I find the best thing that I can accuse you of standing your wife in front of the car and you can sit there and smile at me. When Brian Bardo came back and pointed a finger at Darren, the whole family went ballistic. And how dare Aunt Sandy have brought him into this. Even Darlie Lynn wrote me a letter and said, you need to think about what you're doing. And I have to admit, I wrote back to her and said, you're the one on death row, you need to think about what you're doing. The polygraph wasn't the only revelation about Darren. Pardo also hired a private investigator who discovered that before the murders, Darren suggested hiring someone to rob his house so he could collect insurance money. Darren had come up with a screwball scheme. He had already done one insurance scam. He admitted that to Darley. That was with a car, and uh, he got the money for the car. In a signed affidavit, Darren admitted to both the car scam and his plot for a home robbery. I've known Darren since he was 15 years old. Possibly you could get me to believe that he set it up for a robbery because he talked about that. He would never hurt his children or hurt Darley, never. I will never believe that. But the results of Pardo's investigation differed. Darley had no motive at all, and Darren had $250,000 worth of motive. I met with Darley and told her that we were very persuaded that Darren was a participant in this act. When Darley was told of some of the facts regarding Darren, she totally lost it. And for the first time in her mind, she thought maybe Darren was involved in it. I felt betrayed. Here's the person that I had been with since high school that I had three children with and a good marriage, so I thought. And whether or not that had anything to do with this or not, to know that that had been plotted behind my back hurt, hurt. Did it make you think that maybe he could have been behind this? It's made me have a lot of questions. While any case against Darren would have been purely circumstantial, that didn't explain why Doug Mulder hadn't fended off some of the circumstantial evidence against Darley, who was facing death row. Really, the biggest failing was the failure to use any forensic testing to advance a defense on Darley's behalf. The fire evidence, I think, was probably the strongest forensic evidence that the state had. The state contended that fibers found on a bread knife in the Routier's kitchen matched the slashed window screen. But they didn't do any testing to exclude other sources for that particular fiber or even to pin it down really to the screen and only the screen. The bread knife had been dusted for fingerprints with a brush that raised questions for Cooper. My experts tested seven random fingerprint brushes and four of them had the same chemical consistency and appearance as this one fiber that was found on the bread knife. It's typical in a criminal case that the defense is not satisfied with the state's case. So if there was any dispute, certainly uh, you would have heard from that evidence. If the defense had had any experts, where were they? Where are they? Why aren't they speaking out? The DA at final argument says, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, the defense didn't put up any witnesses to contradict it. So the only evidence before you is what our experts say. Cooper's team also learned about three fingerprints at the crime scene that police had marked as unidentified. But to match these to a potential intruder, they first had to rule out the family. And police had failed to get prints from Devon and Damon's bodies. That left Darley and her family with only one very emotional choice. We had to have them exhumed and have a specialist come in to take their fingerprints because they footprinted them, but they didn't fingerprint them. I just couldn't believe this nightmare had gotten to that point. Darley hoped the boy's prints would soon provide evidence of what she claimed all along, concrete proof of an intruder. Three years after Darley was sentenced to death, 
Her son's bodies were exhumed in an attempt to rule them out as a source of the unidentified fingerprints found at the crime scene. The boys were buried together, holding hands. And so where the hands were together, the vault had flooded, and that totally destroyed the fingerprints. The only other option to identify the fingerprints was DNA, but Cooper's request for testing was denied by the courts. DNA would help, but there's other aspects of the case that I think are very helpful to us, so we're not just limited to the DNA. Cooper felt the prosecution's timeline of events also had flaws. Well, the timeline that's drawn by the state, it was remarkable that they were able to sell it to this jury because of the long time that she was on the telephone with 911. Darley's call to 911 lasted five minutes and 44 seconds. Damon could only have lived for eight or nine minutes after those wounds were inflicted. This is according to courtroom testimony. So since she was on the phone with 911 for five minutes and 44 seconds, she had a lot to do real fast. The biggest wrench in the timeline was the discovery of a bloody sock found in an alley 75 yards away from the Routier home. That sock is the most important piece of evidence in this entire case. There's no way it fits into the timeline. One of the things that had to happen after the boys were stabbed was the blood on the sock, because both boys' blood was found on the sock. They hadn't quite figured out what to do with that sock. There is not but a couple of minutes for her to stab and kill the children, cut the screen, get this sock and run it down the alley in the dark uh, through a gate that doesn't really work very well, come back. Then the state claims that she stood at the kitchen sink and injured herself, staged this crime scene. It really defies common sense to believe that all of that could have been done within that time frame. But during closing arguments, Greg Davis asked the jury what loving mother sleeps through the murder of her two children. And then he told the jury the last thing each of these two children saw was their killer. Everything pointed to Darling. Nothing pointed to anyone else. And I had a hand in convincing a lot of people she did this. Sold over 200,000 books. Barbara Davis' His book had only been out for about a year when she received a call from a deep throat source within the district attorney's office. And that source said to her, you need to meet with me. There's some things you need to say. And within about 20 minutes, I had tears running down my cheeks. I had written a book based on my reputation and my integrity, saying that this woman had killed her children. And I was staring at facts that she indeed had not. After the publication of true crime writer Barbara Davis's scathing book, a secret source within the DA's office showed her evidence that she'd never seen. When I saw the photographs, this was a small police department, never handled a murder case like this, and the pictures were taken out of sequence. Major evidence was picked up and moved around because I saw them here in one picture. You know, they were here in another, contradicting any, any testimony of staging. I learned an hour before the silly string happened, they had a video showing the prayer vigil before the celebration. But the jury never saw this solemn, appropriate um, celebration of the boys' lives. And I began to see other photographs. Her throat was cut where her dominant hand wouldn't do it. Her left hand would have had to have done it. She had bruises up and down her arm. And the picture began to form in my mind the horror of the injuries she had. If the jurors had seen it, it would have been a different outcome. But they didn't even look at the evidence. The last thing they did was play the silly string tape and turn to Charlie Sanford, who was going, I don't want to do this. I don't think she's guilty. And said, now do you think she's guilty? And a freezing, tired, worn out Charlie Sanford finally said, OK. Charlie Sanford was a juror at Darley's trial. When you do something and it's right, after a while, it'll you settle. This never would settle. It never would leave me alone. Like Barbara Davis, Charlie Sanford was shocked to learn about the surveillance tape and the photos of Darley's extensive wounds. There's a lot of evidence that we and the jury never did see. If I would have seen those pictures before, they would have made a lot of difference in what I thought. 
He says he wasn't shown all the evidence, and the evidence he wasn't shown was actually evidence he was shown. When the prosecution gets on their high horse and said the pictures were right there, they sure were with thousands of other things. And they made sure they were mixed in, and the jury was not going to sit through those pictures. Have any of the other jurors had a change of heart? Yes, but they don't want to. They don't want to do this. They see me coming down an aisle at Walmart. They take off around the other way. In June of 2008, Stephen Cooper finally got the break he was looking for when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted DNA testing. It's good news. We've been fighting for it for five or six years. We're trying to get some proof of some male DNA in the house that's connected to the crime scene. The infamous 85J is a fingerprint on a couch table and that bloody print would certainly be one. If DNA ultimately shows that there was, in fact, an intruder that night, how can Darley ever be repaid for all the years of her life that have been spent in a nine by six cell on death row? And how can she ever be repaid for the years she's lost with her sole surviving son? Darley Sundrake is now 19 years old. He's never before given an interview. I usually wouldn't talk about it. A lot of people kind of knew that, yeah, this Draker's here. I mean, his mom's on death row. I mean, it's just part of my life, it's something I've had to live with for 19 years. He's been coming up here since he was, you know, pretty little. I mean, he was a little baby. So this is all he really remembers. Drake lives with his father, Darren, in Lubbock, Texas. Darley and Darren were divorced in 2011. Darren has done a good job of raising Drake. He didn't get the hugs that a mom gives. We don't have contact, so I, I've never gotten to hold him or hug him since I've been in this place. There's just a glass right there in between us. I mean, you can't do anything about it. In the summer of 2013, Drake was forced to deliver devastating news to Darley. I was diagnosed with cancer, I mean, a year ago, June 26th. Drake was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. I was handed a cell phone in the hospital bed. I mean, I heard her voice and I said, Mom, I have cancer. I mean, it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And you know, not being able to hold him, that was extremely hard. Um, I didn't want to break apart for him. I wanted to be strong. Drake's cancer still requires monthly chemotherapy, but his prospects for remission are positive. His body is healing. Yeah, he's, um, he helps keep me fighting for sure. Dolly, will you ever admit to having killed the boys? I'm innocent. Even today, I can't believe that I have a daughter who's innocent on death row. I mean, it's just, it changes your whole life. That's what you think about when you wake up. That's what you think about when you go to bed. Darley's case is currently on hold, pending DNA testing. Cooper believes that the results, specifically those of the bloody fingerprint, will finally prove that there was an intruder at the home on the night of the murders. If we get it reversed by the appellate court, they have to try or dismiss it. With all the evidence that's been established over time, they're not going to retry this case, in my opinion. Well-prepared attorneys with a good strategy will eat the prosecution alive. But time is not on Darley's side. In Texas, if you've been sentenced to death, you have three appeals. Darley Batir has lost her direct state appeal, and she's lost the, uh, the writ appeal from the state. If her federal appeals are denied, then the trial judge from that court will set a date of execution. I fully expect her to be put to death one day, and I think at that time, you know, we can finally say that justice was done in this case, and this case is now closed. This must be really hard for you. What would you say to your mom? I mean, I love you. I mean, I always will. I hope you get out soon. That's it. Darley is unique in the fact that she's maintained her innocence from day one. 
and she was convicted in my mind partially because of Susan Smith and what happened there. It became apparent because of the publicity that mothers kill their children. It created a perfect storm, and that perfect storm swept up a 26-year-old housewife and mother with no prior criminal history and landed her on death row. I'm at peace. I'm at peace. I know I didn't do this. It gives me that peace inside. I can look people in the eye. I've done nothing but tell the truth. My innocent blood will be on their hands, and they will have to answer for that one day. May not be here. They'll have to answer for it.